Hello, this is our next video in a series about limits involving infinity. And I'm going to start by talking about this specific rational function that I have uh, given here. And here's the graph. And we're going to spend uh, a couple of slides and uh, some time figuring out what these asymptotes are. If you graph this function on Desmos, it will just show you the green curve, the three pieces that you see here. I have added the horizontal and vertical asymptotes, so we're going to spend some time seeing why they are what they are and how to figure out how to add those. But hopefully just from the picture you can see what I mean here. Uh, x being plus and minus 2, those are both vertical asymptotes. Those are places where the function is undefined. And so you can see I've written there that if I were to plug in 2 or negative 2 in for x up there in the function, I would get 5 divided by, oops, 0 in the denominator. That's what makes the function undefined at those two points. But that alone is not enough to say that there's a vertical asymptote. It could just be a hole in the function. And so it's really these limits down here that I've written that tell me why they are asymptotes. Uh, it's because the function's approaching plus or minus infinity around those values. And in this case, those are the four limits that, you, that we would see uh, uh, around these asymptotes. As I approach two from the right, see the function shoot up towards positive infinity? That's that one right there. And as I approach two from the left, I see the function shoot down to negative infinity, and that's li that limit down there and very similarly for the other two. And meanwhile, y equals 1 is a horizontal asymptote because this function approaches 1 as I zoom very far to the right or very far to the left. And so as it turns out, uh, it approaches 1 going either to positive infinity or to negative infinity, but just one of those alone would be enough for me to say that y equals 1 deserves to be a horizontal asymptote on this graph. But that's just the overview so far. Let's get into some of the nitty-gritty details to try to convince ourselves using mathematical analysis why these things are happening and not just looking at the graph. So let's uh, see why there are uh, vertical asymptotes, uh, why there is one at x equals 2, and what those two one-sided limits are. In other words, let's explain these two limits down here and uh, reconsider why that tells me that this deserves to be a vertical asymptote like this. I'm going to go through these details for x equals positive 2, and I'll leave it to you for practice at home to go through x equals negative 2, that asymptote. The analysis is very similar. So to analyze the behavior on the right of this vertical asymptote, I'm going to take a limit as x is approaching 2 from the right, from the values just barely bigger than 2, from the positive side. Remember, that's what that little plus notation means. And here's how I would think about this. I'm taking a limit of this fraction, so I'm going to think about what's happening in the top and in the bottom, in the numerator and the denominator. As x approaches 2 from the right, that means I'm going to imagine x values that are just barely, barely, barely bigger than 2, slightly bigger than 2. And what's happening in the top? Well, x squared plus 1 is going to be pretty close to 5. If I plug in 2, I get exactly 5. So if x is a little bit bigger than 2, that's why x squared plus 1 is going to be just a little bit bigger than 5, because x squared itself is going to be a little bit bigger than 4. Meanwhile, in the bottom, in the denominator of that fraction, x squared minus 4 is going to be pretty close to 0, but it's going to be barely positive for the same reasons as x squared plus 1 was just barely bigger than 5. If I'm imagining x to be slightly bigger than 2, then x squared is going to be just a little bit bigger than 4. So when I do x squared minus 4, that's just going to be barely bigger than 0. So that's what I mean by close to 0 and positive. It's a really, really tiny positive number. Now, in case it's helpful, I don't have to do this in addition to what I just said, but in case it's helpful for you, it may help to see that if I factor that expression, x squared minus 4, it's a difference of squares, and I write x minus 2 times x plus 2, maybe it's a little easier, or, or in a different way, you can see why that product will be close to 0 and positive. If x is barely bigger than 2, then x minus 2 is a super tiny, a small positive number, because x is bigger than 2, so x minus 2 is just bigger than 0. And meanwhile, x plus 2 is just a little bit bigger than 4. It's pretty much approximately 4. And so if I do that uh, product of a very small positive times something around 4, that product is a very small, small positive number, close to 0. 
And so overall, I can combine all of these observations to say that, therefore, the fraction, the ratio of the top divided by the bottom is going to output bigger and bigger and bigger positive numbers, and I can say that it's going to go to positive infinity. One way to see that is to straight up rewrite the limit using another variable. That's what I've written over here using z. Uh, I cross my z's like that so they don't look like uh, twos. Um, as x is approaching 2 from the right, we saw how the bottom is going to be essentially approaching 0 from the right, from the positives. That's going to be a very small positive number. So I can rewrite that whole limit as saying, well, what would happen to 5 divided by something getting smaller and smaller, closer to 0 from the positive side? That ratio is positive infinity. Or really, in other words, I have essentially something that's close to constant divided by a really tiny positive number, and that's what's outputting a huge positive number. Think about what would be different as I approach 2 from the left. Try to copy the analysis, the type of thinking that I just wrote out here, uh, and try to do it on your own for what happens for the other side if I approach 2 from the left. So I suggest pausing the video for a minute now and thinking about that, and then unpausing and see what I write. Okay, you're back. Hopefully you found that that limit is negative infinity. The big difference being that if x is approaching 2 from the left, so I have a value for x that's just slightly less than 2, then the numerator, the top of this fraction, is still going to be pretty close to 5, just a little bit less, and the bottom of the fraction is going to be still close to 0, but tiny, tiny negative, just to the left of 0. That's because if x is less than 2, then x squared itself is just going to be a little bit less than 4, and then subtracting 4 is going to shoot me into the just barely negative territory. And here's that factoring idea in case that helps you see that slightly differently. But overall I still have something where I have a constant divided by a really tiny number, but it's a really tiny negative, and that's what makes it approach negative infinity instead. And let's just look back at the graph. Hey, that's exactly what we see. As I approach 2 from the right, it shoots up to positive infinity. As I approach 2 from the left, it shoots down to negative infinity. Great. Next, let's talk about the horizontal asymptote of this function. And so really, the question I'm going to be first answering is, what's the end behavior of this function? What happens, as, uh, what happens to the function as I let x get really, really, really big to the right as x approaches positive infinity? And then we'll come back and look at the limit as x goes to negative infinity instead. But let's start with this one. So let's first of all see why this is an interesting question. Essentially what makes this interesting is that I have two competing forces in this function. As x grows to infinity, the top, the numerator, x squared plus 1, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the bottom, x squared minus 4, the denominator, also just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so I have those two competing forces. Which one is getting bigger faster? That's what this limit is asking. That's really the question uh, in words. Because uh, I have kind of an infinity divided by infinity scenario, I almost don't even want to write that down and give you a bad idea as if I could write that like a regular old fraction. But hopefully that's uh, with the intero bang and the square, scare quotes there, hopefully you'll see that this is not something I really mean. But it's just pointing out why this is an interesting question. It's not obvious what's going on with this function. I have something getting bigger divided by something else getting bigger. And so those forces are going to compete, and as it turns out, they're growing to infinity at pretty much the same rate, and that's why we're going to have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 1. And the algebra technique that I'm about to show you will reveal that. I don't have to just guess it or look at it from the graph. Here's what I would do. The first thing I would do is on the top and the bottom of the fraction to factor out the largest power that I see in both of those expressions. Now in this particular example, that happens to be x squared in the top, and it happens to be x squared in the bottom. But it will not always be that case. I might have a different larger powers in the top and the bottom. And hopefully you agree with those factorizations. If you imagine me distributing that x squared in here, I'd get x squared, and then the 1 over x squared times x squared, that gives me the 1. So that's correct in the top. And then similarly in the bottom, there's the x squared, and there's the minus 4 over x squared times x squared, so there's the minus 4. Now that allows me to cancel those, because I happen to have an x squared in both the top and the bottom there. And now I'm going to be careful and write the equals and scare quotes here, because it's not re really equal. Um, look at the function f at the top. If I plug in x equals 0, I get 1 over negative 4, I get negative a fourth. That, that's a valid 
input-output pair. And yet, if you try to plug in 0 for x into this expression, you get something undefined, because I have 1 over 0 squared in the top and in the bottom. So, so there's, they're not quite the same, because I did this factoring out and canceling. So that's why I'm writing this equals here, and uh, to say that I'm doing some algebra manipulations to make this limit more easy, uh, easier to work with, but I don't want you to think that I, I'm writing down an expression that's totally equivalent to the original function. But, okay, yeah, why have I done this? Well, the whole point is to make taking a limit as x goes to infinity much easier to do. And so think about what happens as I let x go to infinity. We know from the previous video where we talked about a constant divided by a positive power of x, we don't have to think anymore about how that's just going to go to zero, because I have a fixed number divided by larger and larger numbers. And so that tells me that 1 over x squared, that little term right in there, that's going to disappear and fade away to zero. And meanwhile, that part right there, the 4 over x squared, that's also going to shrink and vanish away to zero. And so as I take this limit as x goes to infinity, this question that I, I care about all along, I'm going to get 1 plus something that's disappearing over 1 minus something that's disappearing. I get 1 over 1, I get 1. That's where that asymptote's coming from, and really that's the answer to my limit question. It's 1 because of all of this work that I did there. And here's another uh, added bonus of this. As x is approaching negative infinity, what would be different? Those terms would still shrink away to 0, and I would still be left with 1 over 1. I would get the same result. And so I see that it's not just as x goes to positive infinity, but also to negative infinity. And let's jump back to the graph of that function that we started with. Hey, look at that. As I go to the right, this function is flattening out to y equals 1. And as I go to the left, I see the same behavior. So this is how to see that for a rational function to analyze the limit. Look to factor out the largest power from the top and the bottom separately, and then do some canceling, and hopefully a lot of things go to zero like this, and we're using that fact one from the previous video, really, over and over and over. All right. Um, in this next example, I want to talk about uh, limits going towards infinity, and it's going to be a little different from the previous one. It's similar in the sense that I have a rational function, and you can also see that there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. I think you can see why that's happening, because of the x minus 2 in the bottom. So when x is exactly 2, that's division by 0, and it's undefined there. I will leave it to y'all to figure out the behavior around the asymptote. Why is it that as I approach 2 from the right, it shoots up to positive infinity, whereas if I approach 2 from the left, it shoots down to negative infinity? I'll let you analyze that for yourself. But I want to spend some time here talking about the end behavior to the right and to the left. Or in other words, these two limits here. As x goes to a positive or negative infinity, what's happening to the graph? Well, I can see from the picture that the outputs of the function are just going to grow and grow and grow. And you can kind of predict that by looking at the fact that I have a cube, x to the third in the top, whereas I have a first power, just x in the bottom. And if I make x a much, a really big, big, big number, as I let x go to infinity, x cubed is a heck of a lot bigger than just x itself. So just intuitively, heuristically, that's why I see this behavior shooting off upwards to the right. If x gets bigger and bigger, x cubed grows a lot faster than x itself. And so I'm going to do a little bit of algebra here to reveal that same fact. But then, uh, on the next slide, I'll show you how to actually say something a little more specific about that. We can be more specific and pin down how quickly this function is growing to infinity. And you might even be able to predict what we're going to see. Doesn't that look like a parabola in there? Hmm. All right, let me come back to that idea in a minute. Let's first talk about this, this limit as x goes to positive infinity. There, I've started us off by using a, a similar factoring on the top and the bottom trick, just like we did in the previous example in this step here, where I factored out the largest power on the top and the bottom separately. I'm doing that here too. On the top, I have an x cubed, the largest power. So if I pull that out, I have a 1 and a 2 over x and a 1 over x cubed. And then here in the bottom, I am factoring out just the largest power, x to the 1, and I'm left with a 1 and a 2 over x. So hopefully you can see where that's coming from. And so one thing I then get to do 
is to deal with the x cubed and the x that I've pulled out in front and say, well, I can simplify that a little bit and say that's just x squared. And then everything else I've written inside the parentheses there is just the, the fraction of terms there. And now here's the real benefit. As I take a limit as x goes to infinity, most of these terms inside here are going to vanish away to zero. So there, as I take that limit as x goes to infinity, these three terms, they're all going to vanish away to zero. And so in the long run, in the end behavior, in the limit, my function is going to behave like x squared times a whole bunch of things that work out to be 1. Or in other words, my function is going to behave exactly like the x squared function, which I know is going to grow to positive infinity as x, squared, as x grows and grows to positive infinity. And that phrase down there in the bottom right is a way to summarize that observation. We can say that this graph of this function behaves like the curve y equals x squared in the long run. I don't want to say that this function equals x squared in any valid sense whatsoever, but it does start to behave more and more like it as I travel further to the right, as I go in the long run, as I take a limit as x goes to infinity. And that's exactly what I was hinting at when I drew this parabola back here. If I draw the y equals x squared parabola, I will not see the graph of the function in, in consideration here, f of x, I will not see its graph perfectly equal that parabola, but I will see, as I scroll further to the right on, on the graph, I will see that curve get closer and closer to the y equals x squared parabola. And that's what I'm referring to up the top here when I say a slant asymptote. It's not a horizontal or vertical line, or really even a diagonal line, it's some other curve, but it's still an asymptote. In the long run, as x gets bigger and bigger, this curve will get closer and closer without ever actually touching the y equals x squared curve. And that's what I mean by an asymptote here. Now, everything that I've written down here in terms of the algebra helps me evaluate the limit. I can see where the x squared comes out. Um, but I did some stuff here when I took a limit and I, and I replaced some terms with zero. I said they vanished. And I, and I kind of uh, said that a little bit intuitively at the beginning when I said I have an x to the third in the top, that's the largest power, and I have an x to the one in the bottom, and their ratio is kind of like x squared. So I have some kind of intuition to see all of this stuff. But what, what I want to show you right now is an algebra method. I don't really want to call it a trick. It, it's a technique, a method, that will reveal the same information in a little more of a concrete way, and it might not feel so vague and informal. And what we're going to do is essentially take this fraction here, remember that that quotient means division, and we're going to do some long division. I'm going to simplify that function to show you that it really is x squared plus something a little bit. And we'll see that that something, that little bit, shrinks away to zero in the long run, and then we'll see in a slightly different way why this curve is asymptotically approaching the parabola y equals x squared. So here I've set up my long division, and I know you may be used to doing long division, or probably not anymore, but when you first learned it, you probably certainly learned it with uh, numbers. Well, we can do the same thing here. Um, and just like when you did, just like when you did, for example, 467 divided by 3, if I wrote that as a fraction, well, the way to see that is I wrote 467 divided by 3. And I have, just like in my original fraction here, the thing on the top, divided by the thing on the bottom. But the one difference here is notice that I have 0x in there. That's a placeholder because I have x cubed, a negative 2x squared, no x terms, that's what the 0x means, and then a 1 at the end. And so just like uh, if I had the number 407, for example, I would write it like this and not like 4 space 7, or even worse, like 47. Those are completely different things. That 0x is like a placeholder here. So think about what I would have done with the number division. I would have said, how many times does 3 go into 4? And I would say it goes in once, and then I would do the multiplication. 1 times 3 is 3, and I would start to subtract from there. Let's do the same thing over here. How many times does x go into x cubed? Well, here, think about just the powers of x. x has an x to the 1, and x cubed has an x to the 3, so I think this goes in x squared times. I know there's a minus 2 there, but let's just deal with the power of x. I'm going to say that that x minus 2 thing goes into x cubed x squared many times. So the next thing I'm going to do is multiply that across. 
right underneath and do subtraction, just like I did here. I did 1 times 3 to get 3, and then I started to subtract it. Let's do that here. If I do x squared times x, there's where the x cubed is coming from. And then if I do um, x squared times negative 2, that's where the negative 2 x squared is coming from. And then I start to uh, subtract that, just like I would have done over here with the numbers. I would have said 4 minus 3 is 1. Then I'd start to carry down any extra digits. Let's do the same thing here. Now, I happen to get super lucky in that this divides the first two parts perfectly, so I get a 0. And then I would carry down the 0x. And then I might carry down the plus 1. Uh, let's continue the numbers just for comparison's sake. Uh, I would then say, how many times does 3 go into 16? And I'd say, well, 5 times. And then I do 5 times 3 is 15. I'd subtract that, and I'd get a 1, and I'd carry that 7 all the way down. And I'd say, how many times does 3 go into 17? goes in 5 times. Do 5 times 3, and I'd get 15. I'd have a 2. And then I would have no digits left to carry down. I'm at the end of my division, and unfortunately, 3 doesn't go into 2, and that would be telling me my remainder. I would say it's 155 plus 2 thirds. And indeed, that is true if you do 3 times 155. you get 465, and that's why there's a remainder of 2. And I can see that it's 2 divided by the thing that I'm dividing by. That's what that is. So let's do the same thing over here. Uh, how many times does x minus 2 go into 0 plus 0x zero plus 1? Mm -hmm, it kind of doesn't. I don't have any powers of x here, and I have a single x that I'm trying to get in. So that doesn't fit, so this must be my remainder. And I must have plus 1, the leftover part, just like I had the 2 in the numbers example, divided by the thing I'm dividing by, just like I had thirds from the numbers example. I have x minus 2 in the denominator for this one. So in what sense is this correct? In what sense have I done division here? And what is this remainder business? Well, let me show you uh, another way to think about this. Let's take what I think my answer is and show you how to simplify it into the function I started with by adding, by making a common denominator. You'll see the original function pop out, and that may show you uh, why what we did actually worked. I've started to write out some details down there for that. If I were to add those two things together, I need to create a common denominator. I need to see an x minus 2 in the denominator of the first term, so I'm going to multiply by a phantom 1, and x minus 2 divided by itself, and so that's going to give me a fraction with an x minus 2 in the bottom, and that allows me to add those two things together because they share that common denominator. And in the top, that's going to give me x squared times that x minus 2, and then there's a plus 1 from the other fraction that I'm adding together. And there you can see if I distribute that x squared into the x minus 2, I get exactly the function that I started with. Now, I set this up a little bit so that things worked out pretty nicely. I have just one term plus the remainder. You saw how when I picked that, this happened to divide perfectly into that stuff and a lot of things canceled. But this method will help you with any other example like this. If I have a rational function where the degree on the top is larger than the degree on the bottom, you can do this division. And I'll just make a note over here that this method is applicable as I was just saying, when the degree on the top is equal to or bigger than the degree on the bottom. Uh, just like if I had numbers, it would only make sense to have a number divided by another one and apply a long division when the number on top is actually equal or bigger than the number on the bottom. Same idea. And remember, why did I bother to do all this? Well, hopefully now you can see that as x goes to infinity, that 1 over x minus 2 term is going to vanish and shrink away to 0, and I see how this function behaves exactly like x squared in the long run. And that's just another way of seeing and saying the same thing that I keep saying over and over, which is that this curve is not exactly the parabola, but it looks more and more like the parabola. It's asymptotically approaching the parabola as I go to the right like that. So I wanted to include all this to show you that there aren't just horizontal and vertical asymptotes. Yeah, they're pretty interesting, and a lot of examples have things like that. But there are plenty of other kinds of asymptotes, especially for rational functions like this. And using certain algebra methods, like I used here, or this whole long division trick, uh, 
will help you uh, better see and understand and discover new facts about these kinds of functions. Okay, that's all for now. See you next time.